Welcome to Backyard Professor Videos. I'm the Backyard Professor, Carrie Shirts. I've had some questions about Nephi's steel bow. Again, I want to use this particular instance as an illustration of why I really like it when critics ask us the questions about the Book of Mormon. That's exciting because it does cause us to take a closer look at the Book of Mormon. And that's always beneficial. Sometimes even we, re we misread the Book of Mormon or we're misunderstanding something or we just simply aren't aware of the scholarly materials that have gone on before. The steel bow of Nephi has certainly been discussed. Let me start off with a huge source this is Hugh Nibley's An Approach to the Book of Mormon. Now this is his third edition that was put out by Deseret Bookstore and Farms, the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, in 1988, this third edition. It's a reprint. On page 231, he talks about the hunting weapons. Every Bedouin is a sportsman. They are sportsmen both from taste and necessity. This one observer says, he explains how in large families some of the young men are detailed to spend all their time hunting. Now, Nephi and his brothers took over the business of full-time hunters. And in that office, of course, they betray the desert tradition of the family. Because Nephi had brought with him a fine steel bow from home. And he knew how to use it. In fact, he explicitly tells us that the hunting weapons he used were bows and arrows stones and slings. This is 1 Nephi 16 verse 15. That is another evidence in favor of the Book of Mormon. For manes are found that those were indeed the hunting weapons of the early Hebrews. And never did they use the classic hunting weapons of their neighbors, which was the sword, the lance, the javelin, and the club. The bow, Manger tells us, was usually made of hard elastic wood, but quite often of metal. We do not know whether it resembled the Arabic or the strong Persian bow. Evidence for metal bows, Manger himself finds in 2 Samuel 22.35 and Job 20.24. There's no need to argue, as we once did, in favor of a partly metal bow. This has absolutely been confirmed now. This is how they understand. So that this is the way we can understand Nephi's metal bow. Things looked dark when he broke his, for his fine steel metal bow. For the wooden bows of his brothers had lost their springs. Notice the interesting Semitic plural there. They lost their springs. 1 Nephi 16.21 Though they were skilled in the art of hunting, they knew very little about bow making, which is a skill reserved to specialists even among the primitives. Incidentally, archery experts say that a good bow will keep its spring for about 100,000 shots, from which one might calculate that the party at the time of the crisis had been traveling anywhere from one to three years out there in the wilderness. So this idea of he couldn't make a composite bow, of course not. He was out in the wilderness. He wasn't back home where he had all his tools. It was something of a marvel when Nephi did make a bow out of wood. It was even mentioned, 1 Nephi 16.23. Because a hunter would never dream of changing from a composite to a simple bow. Though it sounds simple enough when we read about it, it was almost as great a feat for Nephi to make a bow as it was for him to build a ship. And he was justly proud of his achievement. According to the ancient Arab writers, the only bow wood obtainable in all of Arabia was the knob wood that grew only amid the inaccessible and overhanging crags of Mount Jasum and Mount Ozd, which are situated in the very region where, if we follow the Book of Mormon, the broken bow incident occurred. How many factors must be correctly conceived and correlated to make the apparently simple story of Nephi's bow ring true? The high mountain near the Red Sea at a considerable journey down the coast, the game on the peaks that they could hunt, hunting with a bow and a sling, and finding of bow wood viewed as something of a miracle by the party themselves. 
What are the chances of reproducing such a situation by mere guesswork? That's Nibley on page, it continues on to page 232. So that's one incident. We know now that the bow was a composite metal wood bow. Now, archaeologically, something else has, has uh, come up very interestingly. Before I get to that, before I get to the archaeology, this is re-exploring the Book of Mormon edited by John Welch, uh, pages 41 and 42. Not only did Nephi say that he rebuilt a bow, but he also found straight sticks and rebuilt his arrows. This is crucial piece of evidence for the authenticity of the record, because this is precisely what a hunter has to do, and here's why. Alan Goff showed that three times in the record, Nephi mentioned that he had broken his bow, but not once did he say that any of his arrows were damaged. Yet in 1 Nephi 16.23, Nephi says that he did make out of wood a bow and out of a straight stick an arrow. Why would he need to make a new arrow if his old ones were still intact? David S. Fox suggests an answer. Whoever wrote this account of Nephi was familiar in some detail with the field of archery. Now we have an expert archer discussing the archery of Nephi. Very interesting. Consider what happens to an arrow at the instant the string is released. The full force of the drawn string is applied to the end of the arrow, trying to accelerate it, but also tending to bend or buckle the arrow. If the bow's draw weight and the arrow's stiffness are not perfectly matched, the arrow will stray off the intended course or fall short of, short of the mark. An arrow that is too flexible will leave the bow with a vibration that can cause the arrow to behave erratically. An arrow that is too stiff is probably going to be too heavy for the bow. So Nephi was forced to make both of his new weapons, the bow and the arrows, to match this new bow. An authentic piece of archery understanding. How would Joseph Smith have known that? We don't know. He wasn't around any archers. He, wasn't, he didn't practice archery with anybody. Nobody that we're aware of that was around him while he was translating the Book of Mormon knew much about archery that we're aware of. It's nifty little extra details like that that are very impressive in the Book of Mormon, written as only a true eyewitness record can be. In Nibley's book, Lehi in the Desert and the World of the Jaredites, page 59, he says the, uh, the chariots of iron that are mentioned in the Old Testament. When we, when we consider steel, Nephi's steel bow, it doesn't mean a solid steel bow. It can be a composite material. Just like uh, the Canaanite's chariot of iron mentioned in Joshua 17, verses 16 through 18, and Judges chapter 1, verse 19, and Judges chapter 4, verse 3. These weren't solid iron chariots. Of course not. Or than any of the other various implements mentioned in the Old Testament as being of iron, such as carpenter's tools, pens, threshing instruments, were iron and only iron. It was, in all probability, a steel-ribbed bow since it broke at about the same time that the wooden bow of his brothers lost their springs. 1 Nephi 16.21 Only composite bows were used in Palestine. That is, bows of more than one piece. And a steel-backed bow would be called a steel bow, just as an iron-trimmed chariot was called a chariot of iron. Incidentally, the founder of the Turkish Seljuk dynasty of Iran was called Yakak, Y-A-Q-A-Q, -A -A Yakak, which means in Turkish, a bow made out of iron. The fact that iron arrow was a fairly common name among these people and refers actually to an iron-headed arrow only, well, this is a strong indication that the name steel bow also refers to a real weapon. But it's not solid steel. But they had that capability and technology back in Jerusalem area, 600 B.C., and in Saudi Arabia. 
That's on pages 59 and 60 of uh, Nibley's book, Lehi in the Desert. 